Hey everyone, Dr. Kofi here, and welcome to the Tutor Med channel, where everything medicine is simplified. We will discuss a clinical case in obstetrics and gynecology today. And so if you are preparing for your licensure exam, this is the right place for you to be. I want to say a very big thank you to all my subscribers. Now, if you are new here, kindly consider subscribing and putting us on post notification. For this video, kindly like, share and leave your comments in the comment section. Alright, your notepads ready? Let's get started. Alright, let's see our clinical case. And so we have a 24 year old with an 8 week gestation who presents with excessive vomiting with severe dehydration. There is no pathological cause. Now there are four questions for this clinical case. The first question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? Let's take a few seconds to think through the question. Very well. And so the relevant information in this clinical case include the fact that we have a 24-year-old with an 8-week gestation. Then she presented with excessive vomiting. The word is excessive. Then we have severe dehydration. Then more importantly, there was no pathological cause. And so the most likely diagnosis for this clinical case is hyperemesis gravidarum. Now, emesis means vomiting, and so hyperemesis means excessive vomiting. Gravidarum is a term for pregnancy, and so the meaning of this term is excessive vomiting in pregnancy. Hyperemesis gravidarum. And so let's use the subsequent slides to understand this diagnosis. So the first is that this patient is a young expectant mother. The second is that she's in her first trimester, the early parts of her first trimester. And then she came with excessive vomiting. The vomiting was so excessive or severe that it has led to severe dehydration. And then more importantly, there is no pathological cause as to why she's having excessive vomiting. Now, the fact that there is no pathological cause makes hyperemesis gravidarum most likely. In other words, hyperemesis gravidarum is considered when there is no underlying pathological cause after clinical assessment, and so it is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, nausea and vomiting are common in pregnancy and is considered normal when it is mild, a condition known as morning sickness. The term morning sickness is a misnomer because this nausea and vomiting can even occur at night. And so, the nausea and vomiting in pregnancy is a spectrum. We can have a mild form, a moderate form, and a severe form, so it is a spectrum. Hyperemesis gravidarum is the term used to describe the severe end of the symptom spectrum. And more importantly, like we mentioned earlier, the vomiting must not be explained by any pathological cause. And so if you have someone having a severe form of vomiting in pregnancy and then there is no pathological cause, then the person is likely to have hyperemesis gravidarum. And so generally, we should suspect hyperemesis gravidarum when the vomiting is so severe that it is associated with significant weight loss. That is weight loss that is more than 5% of the pre-pregnancy weight. Most of the times, we use the booking weight, the first weight measured at the antenatal care if, or at the antenatal clinic if the weight after the period of hyperemesis is less than 5% of the booking weight, then there is significant weight loss. So we need to be thinking of hyperemesis gravidarum. And then usually, hyperemesis gravidarum starts early in the pregnancy, in the first trimester. But some cases may start in the second trimester. But usually, 
although it starts in the second trimester, it should start before 16 weeks, usually. Then, when the vomiting is associated with severe dehydration or dehydration, like we saw in our clinical case, and electrolyte imbalance. And then, when the vomiting is so severe that the patient starts having ketones in the urine, so ketonuria, which is not explained by any other cause like starvation or diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, remember we said that to establish hyperemesis gravidarum, we need to make sure that there is no underlying pathological cause. And so, what are some of the pathological causes of vomiting in pregnancy? This list is not exhaustive. We are going to just mention a few. And so, one of the causes include gastroenteritis, then acute pyelonephritis, an acute um, inflammation of the renal parenchyma as a result of an infection. Then we have molar pregnancy. Molar pregnancy is also a pathological cause of excessive vomiting in pregnancy. Then we have a patient with an acute exacerbation of peptic ulcer disease. Then we can have a patient with acute abdomen. It could be appendicitis, acute appendicitis. It could be acute cholecystitis, acute intestinal obstruction, acute pancreatitis, biliary colic, ureteric colic. Then a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis can also have excessive vomiting and it's pathological. A patient with migraine headaches, severe migraines can give you excessive vomiting. And then a patient with hyperthyroidism. But we will learn later that hyperemesis gravidarum itself causes a transient hyperthyroidism. And so the hyperthyroidism, sorry, thyroidism here should not be as a result of another cause. I don't know if I am clear. So hyperthyroidism when found should be because of another cause other than hyperemesis gravidarum because hyperemesis gravidarum itself can cause hyperthyroidism. And so these are the few causes of pathological, um, I mean pathological causes of vomiting in pregnancy. There are tons of them but I listed a few. We can have benign intracranial hypertension that one can also cause um, vomiting in pregnancy. Now, the second question says, what two differential diagnoses will you be excluding on ultrasound? Now, vomiting in pregnancy has a positive correlation with the levels of beta ACG in the woman's blood. Beta ACG is the hormone produced by the placenta, the same hormone we use to diagnose pregnancy. And so, if you have any condition which results in excessive levels of beta ACG um, in the blood, then you can have excessive vomiting because the higher your beta ACG, the higher the chances of having excessive vomiting. And so two of such conditions can be excluded on ultrasound. One is gestational trophoblastic disease. And specifically, I want to mention molar pregnancy. Gestational trophoblastic disease is a general umbrella, but molar pregnancy is one of the gestational trophoblastic diseases. And so that one can be excluded on ultrasound. Then another cause of excessive vomiting in pregnancy that can be excluded on ultrasound is multiple gestation. So someone with a twin gestation, triplet gestation, quadruplet, quintuplet. So it makes sense that we have, for example, if you have a triplet gestation, we have three different placenta or placentas, if you will. And then each of them is producing beta ACG. You realize that the additive effects or the overall level of beta ACG is going to go high and so this patient is likely to have excessive vomiting since excessive vomiting or vomiting in pregnancy has a correlation with the levels of beta ACG. Now the third question says state two complications of your diagnosis. So the complications include electrolyte abnormalities. The patient has vomited so much that she's losing electrolytes and then some of them include potassium and so can have hypokalemia. The second complication, she can have oesophageal rupture. Sometimes the vomiting can be very violent that the oesophagus can be injured and so she can have oesophageal rupture. She can have orthostatic hypotension because she's lost so much fluid when she 
takes or when she assumes the erect position her blood pressure falls and that is orthostatic hypotension in a simple way then she can have liver damage hyperemesis gravidarum has been known to cause some liver damage then she can have severe hyper sorry severe dehydration which she had which can lead to shock and remember she can have a transient hyperthyroidism like i mentioned earlier hyperemesis gravidarum has been found to be associated with a transient hyperthyroidism then she can have Wernicke encephalopathy. Usually during their vomiting episodes, they become malnourished. Not bad, but they can have some nutritional deficiencies and some of them include vitamin B1 or thiamine. And so if they're taking glucose without the vitamin B1, which is an important cofactor of gluc- glucose metabolism in the brain, they can have Wernicke encephalopathy. Very good. And so please do not forget to like and share this video. Leave your comments in the comment section below. And then subscribe to our channel if you have not done that yet. And then put us on post notification. Now the last question says, how will you manage this patient? Now always remember our principles of management. That we treat any reversible underlying cause. And then we manage the symptoms. And then lastly, we prevent the complications. That if they have already occurred, we manage them. And so for this patient, her condition has no underlying pathological cause. She has an extreme form of vomiting in pregnancy. So when the pregnancy ends, the vomiting would end. So there is no underlying cause to treat. So in managing her symptoms, we first want to keep her nail perros initially. Then there are some anti-emetics that we can give, but we'll discuss that shortly. But she came with some complications like the severe dehydration and so we need to manage the complication we need to give IV fluids for resuscitation to correct the dehydration first and then IV fluids for her maintenance I mean her maintenance fluid requirements targeting an adequate urine output it means that for this severely dehydrated woman we need to have passed a urethral catheter and then give her some fluids to monitor her urine output to ensure it is adequate the fluid you can give include IV ringers lactate and then if dextrose is to be given we give IV thiamine first which is vitamin B1 because remember we said vitamin B1 is a cofactor for energy metabolism in the brain and we give it first to minimize the risk of when the case encephalopathy in which the patient would be confused suddenly would have nystagmus and then others or other things I mean to say Good. And so when we do her serum electrolytes and we find any electrolyte anomalies, we need to correct any electrolyte imbalances like the hypokalemia. Then for the anti-emetics to stop the vomiting, if the fluid resuscitation and then in initial keeping no perils doesn't work, we give anti-emetics. So the anti-emetics we can give include vitamin B6. It can be given as a monotherapy. And then we can also give doxylamine. In fact, doxylamine can be given with vitamin B6 as a dual therapy. Then there are others including prometazine, we have metoclopramide, ondansetron. Now, there are some dietary changes which can help with this condition. So after the woman has been kept um, neoperous and can now tolerate foods, the patients are advised to eat before or as soon as they feel hungry to avoid empty stomach because empty stomach can worsen the nausea which can bring about the vomiting. And then meals and snacks should be eaten slowly and in small amounts like every one to two hours to avoid a sudden or an overly full stomach because this has also been known to worsen or precipitate the vomiting and overly full stomach. And then ginger containing foods also have this anti nauseatic effect and so they are encouraged. And so this is the end of our tutorial in obstetrics and gynecology today. Thank you for watching. Kindly like and share the video, very important. And then subscribe to the channel if you have not done that yet. Thank you all for subscribing. And then we would meet again in our next lecture. Bye.